The next uh, award that um, I'd like to uh, ha take a hand in presenting is the John Martin Award for a high impact paper. And uh, this is an award that has only been around a very short time. Um, it, uh, it's in honor of, of John Martin and, it, and was to recognize a paper in the aquatic sciences judged to have a high impact on subsequent research in the field. Uh, the model uh, was a, a wonderful paper by John Martin et al., which laid out the case for iron limitation of phytoplankton in the ocean. There have been, um, oh, the, <clears throat> actually the award is also for papers that are at least 10 years old to continue to ha make a very strong contribution. And you can see the three past recipients noted on the, um, on the slide uh, in front of you. <clears throat> And this year's award I'm delighted to announce is uh, to be presented to Mimi Cole and Rudy Strickler and uh, for this uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful paper in limnology and oceanography on uh, copepod, feeding, uh, cur um, copepod feeding currents food capture at low Reynolds numbers, an enormously uh, innovative, heuristic, and instructive piece of work. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in the er uh, late late uh, 1970s, copepod feeding was thought of in a very different way. <clears throat> and Rudy Strickler, uh, who was then, I think, in, in Ottawa, uh, used to show up at McGill, where I was a student, showing us these wonderful um, uh, high-speed uh, high uh, uh, cinema um, portrayals of feeding and a variety of different kinds of organisms. Uh, very interesting work, and uh, continued to do this for quite some time. He was joined then by Mimi Cole, in uh, putting together uh, this uh, wonderful, wonderful paper that has been enormously influential. I won't take up too much more time, but I would like to uh, give, uh, to read to you just a little bit from the, uh, from the abstract of that paper that gives you some sense of the importance and lasting importance of this work. In the viscous world of a feeding copepod, water flow is laminar. Bristled appendages behave as solid paddles rather than open rakes. Particles can neither be scooped up nor left behind because appendages have thick layers of water adhering to them, and water and particle movement stops immediately when an animal stops beating its appendages. Spectacular work, and we're very lucky today to be able to present the Martin Award uh, to uh, Cole and uh, Strickler, and Mimi's here to say some, uh, to accept the award and to uh, speak, about the, speak about the work. Uh, Mimi, uh, Carlos, could you come up and present the award? So it is uh, my great pleasure and honor to present Mimi Cole and Rudy Strickler with the John Martin Award for a high impact paper in the aquatic sciences. And I will read the citation, which reads, for the benchmark mark paper, Coyle and Strickler, 1981, copepod feeding currents, food capture at low renal numbers, limnology and oceanography 26, 1062 to 1073, demonstrated that the best way to understand copepod feeding was by combining careful observations using high-speed movies and the application of basic physical scaling using the renal numbers. So Mimi is going to receive the awards on behalf of herself and Rudy Stickler. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I will try to um, uh, do the assignment I was given when um, uh, I was uh, told that I would receive this award for Rudy and me and um, give a talk. Here's the paper being honored, and my assignment, instead of telling you about the research I'm doing nowadays, my assignment, hmm, it's not, uh, was to tell you about the background that led up to this work. And um, this is very slow. And my instructions were specifically to set the stage of what the field was like before we started and to really focus on the human dimension of what was going on rather than the science. 
So I had a real trip down memory lane, and I wanted to thank Rudy Strickler, Tim Coles, Gus Poffenhofer, Dan Rubenstein, and Steve Vogel for all sending me their memories of what was going on at the time, and also old pictures uh, <laughs> that you'll see in this talk. And you're encouraged to laugh at the way we dressed and the way we wore our hair back then. Um, so the real hot topic, <coughs> excuse me, in plankton, or in um, biological oceanography back in the 70s was plankton trophic dynamics. And in particular, people were especially interested in copepods eating phytoplankton. And the types of experiments that were being done were feeding experiments where the copepods and the phytoplankton of interest were put together in uh, some sort of container and the, the feeding rate uh, was measured, in other words, the rate at which algae disappeared from the container. And this sort of black box experiment was just fine if what you're trying to do is describe the rates at which different things are happening in plankton communities, but did anybody care about the underlying mechanisms that were responsible for these rates? Well, back at that time, at least one person cared, and that was uh, Rudy Strickler. And uh, in Rudy's own words, uh, the way he describes his research focus at that time was to see how copepods feed on single algae at the spatial and temporal resolution of the action, that is, of the individual copepod. And he was starting out doing this by making funky old Super 8 uh, movies of zooplankton. And the way Rudy tells the story, he uh, went off to give a department seminar at Dartmouth where he showed some of these movies. And one of the per people who heard the um, a talk was R.D. Allen. And as Rudy says, R.D. Allen gave me a high-speed camera, film, and advice about how to use it. And Rudy took that and ran with it. And anybody who's ever seen Rudy give a talk knows that he's developed incredible optics to permit us to see things at a very fine scale. And um, so Rudy's focus was really studying zooplankton behavior, and he asked me to make sure that I uh, mentioned to all of you the graduate students who were working with him at the time, Mark Friedman, Bob Zarrett, and Gene Rosenberg. And he also said that his thinking at the time was very much influenced by Stan Corson and Steve Vogel. And the other issue Rudy was really focused on then is there must be sensors involved. These animals uh, weren't just little dumb uh, uh, filtering machines. Well, in the meantime, while Rudy was doing that, I was up to something entirely different. Uh, my field, uh, my training is in biomechanics, and I was at the time studying the hydrodynamics and biomechanics of benthic wave-swept organisms. I was a graduate student at Duke, and at the time, Steve Vogel was a professor there, to, and he taught a wonderful course called Life and Moving Fluids, which since has become a book some of you may be familiar with. Another student in that class was Dan Rubenstein, and he was an animal behaviorist. And a student project in that course led to a collaboration between Dan and me that we carried on after the course. And what we were um, investigating were the physical mechanisms by which suspension feeding organisms could capture particles out of the fluid around them. So it was a theoretical study. And I won't bore you with the details, but it made some inter interesting predictions. One thing we filtered, uh, uh, learned, was that filters can catch particles smaller than the gap size between the uh, filtering elements. So filters didn't have to be spaghetti strainers. They could catch much smaller things. And we also, uh, the physics led us to discover that uh, particle size selectivity of a filter could be changed either by changing the speed that you move the filter around or the diameter of the hairs that uh, composed it. So Dan and I were really excited about this, talking about it all the time and boring all our graduate student friends by talking about it endlessly. But one friend, uh, a biological oceanographer uh, with us at Duke at the time, was Tim Coles. And he was very patient uh, listening to us go on and on about this. Well, after I finished graduate school, I uh, wrote a proposal to test this basic model uh, and the, its predictions using simple benthic suspension feeders, and it was rejected out of hand, uh, and the reviews, we're used to getting reviews that tell you about the substance. These reviews were very short, and all they said were, we don't know what this is, but it is an oceanography, so don't fund it. But I went ahead and did it anyway. Um, 
Uh, in the meantime, Tim was doing feeding experiments with copepods that were yielding some very interesting results. He found that they were selective feeders and that a particular species of copepod could switch the kinds of particles it was being selective and catching. And he started wondering how on earth this was happening. And he remembered the stuff Dan and I had told him and wondered if the switching mechanisms we had discovered that came out of the physics might be involved. Well, by that time, both uh, Tim and I were grown-ups, and we were teaching at Brown University, and so we'd get together for coffee after class, and he kept bugging me about this copepod stuff. And it was very tempting. Here are some uh, examples of uh, copepod feeding appendages. They're made up of uh, rows of hairs, seedy, with little hairs on them, cetules. And uh, they sure look like filters, and they have this, this neat diversity of morphology, so it would be a great system for testing my ideas about uh, suspension feeding. So um, uh, I started learning more about copepods, and this is what the textbooks at the time said about how copepods feed. Uh, the copepods flap these uh, funky uh, appendages up towards the front of the body, which produce these swirly feeding currents, and also, at the same time, drove fluid through the second maxillae, which are those appendages I just showed you, which were held stationary over the mouth of the animal. So uh, we were taught that water was pushed through stationary second um, maxillae and that algae were strained out of the water by those appendages, so selectivity depended on the pore size of the second maxillae. Now I had some, uh, oh, and, and those, uh, that idea of mechanism formed the basis for a lot of different foraging models for copepods that were being developed at the time. Well, coming from a fluid mechanics background, I had a couple of problems with this. For one thing, I think this water swirling around in circles was an artifact of the fact that to watch a copepod feed, you had to put it in a tiny little drop of water on a microscope slide. So where else was the water going to go except around in circles? And I also had a really hard time understanding how that current could drive fluid through those tiny second maxillae, and I wondered if they even were filters at all. So um, let me give you a little bit of uh, fluid mechanics background to tell you why I was worried about this. So let me ask you to do a thought experiment. Uh, imagine uh, having a big vat of, of water that you stir up, or imagine being in the bathtub flailing around. And what you see happen is that the flow patterns you produce, it's easy to disturb the fluid, and it's turbulent and messy. And if you stop flailing around, the fluid still keeps moving for quite some time, because it has a out of inertia. So that's the sort of flow situation where inertial forces predominate. Eventually, if you stop moving, the water stops moving. And the reason it does is that the viscosity or the resistance of the water to being sheared finally damps out that motion. So now I want to ask you to do a very kinky thought experiment. Imagine filling that bathtub now with something like honey and move very slowly in, in the honey and watch what happens. And what you see is that the flow is very neat and laminar and smooth. It's hard to mix things up. If you reach out to grab something, it just gets pushed away by the fluid. If you stop moving, immediately the, the honey grinds to a halt. That's a flow situation dominated by this viscosity rather than inertia. So uh, there's a nice simple um, expression, uh, the Reynolds number, that represents how important inertia is relative to viscosity. And it simply depends on the length of the body you're interested in, the velocity of the fluid, and the density of the fluid. And it's inversely proportional to the resistance of the fluid to being sheared. So if you think about it, uh, for large organisms like us and whales and seagulls that move rapidly, uh, flow is high Reynolds number inertial turbulent flow. But for very small things, like the hairs on a copepod second maxilla that move slowly, 
uh, they're going to operate at low Reynolds number where the flow is very viscous. So it's very non-intuitive how fluid behaves um, for us high Reynolds number organisms. Another thing to think about is whenever you have some solid surface, like the surface of a, a CETA, and you have fluid moving relative to that surface, there's a, a layer of fluid in contact with the surface that doesn't slip relative to the surface. And the net result is that a velocity gradient develops in the fluid uh, along that surface. And without getting into all the boring details, the lower the Reynolds number, the thicker that layer of slowed fluid will be relative to the dimensions of the object. And the same thing is true for stationary fluid with a structure moving through it. Uh, a layer of fluid sticks to and moves with that structure, and the lower the Reynolds number, the thicker that layer of fluid is that schlepped along with the structure. So now let's think about something like the second maxilla. It's made up of a row of cylinders of finite width, so fluid can go through the gaps or it can go around the edges of the array. And if uh, there's a very thin layer of fluid stuck to each hair, then the water is going to flow through and we have a leaky appendage. In contrast, if there's a thick layer of fluid stuck to each hair, most of the fluid is going to go around the array and it's going to not be leaky. So even though it's full of holes, it's going to function as a paddle. So um, I started wondering, it's critical to know the Reynolds number of those CD on uh, copepod second maxillae if we're going to figure out how they work. So I went back to Tim with this wish list of the things that we would need to know to answer his questions. Somehow we'd have to make movies of moving appendages of copepods so we could get uh, work out their kinematics and uh, how the water moved and the cell velocities. And we'd also have to do a lot of SEM to get all the dimensions we needed for the modeling. Uh, so we wrote a proposal to study the hydrodynamics of copepod selective feeding. And again, it was rejected this time, not because it wasn't oceanography, but because it was an unimportant aspect of oceanography. So we decided that we would do the work anyway out of pocket. But the problem was that we didn't have any equipment because we didn't have any money. Now, while Tim and I were talking about this, Tim was also talking with his oceanographic colleagues, uh, uh, one of whom was Gus Poffenhofer. And at that time, Gus was collaborating with Miguel Algarez and Rudy Strickler doing some very interesting filming experiments in Rudy's lab. So uh, let me tell you, uh, why do you need a dog to study copepods? So if you want to see what a copepod is doing when it's feeding, you realize that they move their appendages very rapidly, 30 to 100 cycles per second, depending on which species. So you need to make high-speed movies to slow that motion down. Uh, the copepod is also tiny, so you've got to look at it through a microscope. And you don't want to study it in a drop of water because we already saw what problems that causes, so you put them in an aquarium. Well, luckily, copepods hover when they're feeding, but they never, ever hover where you have your microscope aimed. So you have to have copepods in bondage and put them on tethers. So the tether was a dog hair. So here's Miguel getting a hair off a dog. And then you crazy glue that hair to the copepod carapace so you have a tethered copepod. Then you mount the tethered copepod in a small aquarium. And here's a close-up view where you can see uh, uh, the copepod on the hair, the aquarium, and the microscope lens. Then you add phytoplankton to the aquarium so the copepod has something to eat. You shoot a high-speed movie, 500 frames per second is what, what they were using. And if you got all of this to work, you celebrate. So let me show you one of their early movies of a copepod feeding. So what you see here, this is a eucalinus. It's in this orientation. Its anterior end is here. The second maxillae are here, and here are the appendages that create the feeding current. So look at that. You can see that there are very complicated motions that are producing the scanning current. And uh, how on earth do those motions create the scanning current? The only way to answer that would be to see how the water flows, which these movies don't show. Now here's another uh, movie. This is uh, an animal that's kind of in this orientation with its ventral side up. And its second maxillae are right here. And watch what happens in this movie. There are the second maxillae. 
And here's the feeding current, but now why? Oh, they take breaks. They're complicated. Look at this. It's catching algae, and it's actively moving the second maxillae. They're not stationary sieves at all. They're actively doing something funky to catch algal cells. So they're not passive sieves. They're actively doing something. But how are they catching the algal cells? We can't figure that out either because we can't see the water flow. So anyway, Tim and I were talking about how we needed to make all these measurements from movies. Tim was talking to Gus, and Gus was talking to Rudy, and so Rudy very graciously invited all of us to come to his lab in Ottawa and do the necessary experiments. Uh, Tim's job was to look at how changes in behavior uh, uh, would occur when food conditions change, and my job was to measure water flow and figure out the hydrodynamic mechanisms involved in particle capture. Uh, I visualized the water flow by releasing food coloring from a micropipette near the copepod so you could see how the water uh, was moving. And I do have to tell you the research conditions back then. I'm amazed that we actually got anything to work. For one thing, the only way to maintain the temperature in that aquarium, uh, Rudy thought, was to turn the heat off in the, in the lab so it was really cold. And in fact, I ended up wearing all the clothes I had brought to work there every day, all of them, one, and I put a different outfit on top each day so it looked like I changed my clothes, but those guys thought I was enormously fat. Um, uh, we made high-speed movies not using video but using cine film. And, uh, uh, and so what would happen, the constraints of doing that, is you'd only get seven seconds per reel of film, and often, you know, you'd trigger the camera and it would go, Bruh! and then it was over. And if you didn't get the film in exactly right, what would happen would be confetti of film would explode out of the camera all over the lab. So that would happen every once in a while. And then, now you just look at the monitor and you see what you got. Then we would have to send the film out for developing, so we wouldn't even know what we got for several days, and it cost $50 a reel to find out what we got, and there were a lot of expensive duds. So let me show you one of our very first films uh, in this study, and what you're going to see is a head-on view of a copepod. It's a eucalyptus again. So it's in this orientation. The second maxillae are, are here, and, um, and these are the feeding appendages, and this little streak you're going to see is the dye. And here are the second maxillae. So here's the animal again. Here's the dye. And let's watch what we saw. And you can't believe how exciting this was the first time we saw this. So notice that it really is laminar flow. This is just food coloring. But notice how it stays nice and smooth. Now look, the second maxillae are doing something funky. And look at the waters being drawn in there. And it, look how sticky it looks. And now watch, he's going to catch an algal cell. Bloop. OK, so that's what we saw. So that's the, the first movie there that really worked well. So we see that it's laminar flow, and it bypasses the second maxillae. The, uh, the um, textbooks were wrong. Uh, and then the second maxillae do something funky and active to catch those particles. How? Well, to figure out how, we had we, I, I didn't have a grant, so I didn't have anybody to help me. I had to march through those films frame by frame by frame and digitize each frame to figure out what's going on. And this diagram sort of summarizes uh, what we saw. This is a side view of the copepod and a head-on view. And the mechanism that they use to catch the algal cell, which is diagrammed there, is uh, something we called the fling because it was very reminiscent of the flings that insect wings use when they fly. So basically, the second maxillae would fling apart. They weren't leaky, so they were functioning like paddles. And when they flung apart, it created a gap between them that drew the water and the algal cell towards the mouth. So they'd fling apart and draw the algal cell in. But then what happened was really cool. If they just moved back together, it would squirt right back out. But they did something cool, which we called the squeeze. So uh, they would squeeze. 
very rapidly squeeze the second maxillae back towards the body while moving those other appendages in a funky way that gave the water no escape route and the water uh, would, some of the water would get squeezed out through the gaps between um, the CD and the second maxillae and what the copepod was left with was a parcel of water with the algal cell in it in this cage. And then what they did was come in with the endites of the first maxillae and shove, it looked like they were eating jello with raisins in it. They would shove that water with the dye and their transparency, you could see it, into their mouth. So they were eating the water and the algae that they, they caught. So that's uh, how they uh, were feeding. And if you look carefully at single frames of the film, you see that the water really does not go between uh, the CD. Here's a second maxilla sweeping this way. You can see the individual CD and you can see uh, that the water is just pushed along with them. So um, uh, the second maxillae really are paddles. Uh, I'll re very briefly mention that um, this work that uh, I did with Rudy Sur inspired the work that I did for a number of years after that because copepods are not the only animals with hairy appendages. Uh, other uh, zooplankton catch food with hairy appendages. Uh, a lot of animals have gills which are hairy appendages that are picking up molecules, that is oxygen from the fluid around them. And uh, olfactory antennae are hairy structures that are picking up uh, odor molecules from the fluid around them and lots of uh, little creatures swim around with hairy appendages or fly around with hairy wings. So uh, we have been uh, looking at uh, the basic, um, these are really important functions. They, uh, how do they all work? They all depend on these hairy appendages interacting with the fluid around them, either water or air. And so I went on to, to uh, work on the, the basic physics of how all these appendages work in all these different functions. They all operate at low to intermediate Reynolds numbers. And uh, we studied the, the physics of, of how um, uh, all these functions depend on the fluid interacting with the hairs. Now I'm getting the high sign that I need to shut up, so I'm going to quickly cut to the chase at the very end, so ignore all of this, which you've heard me talk about at other meetings. But um, let me get to, whoops, don't peek, the take-home messages. Okay, so my take-home messages for the history of, of this work is for all you graduate students out there, don't just talk to only the people in your own lab. If you talk to folks who are working in other fields, like I did talking to, to, to Dan and Tim, you'll get new ideas for exciting work. And to those of you uh, fat cats with fancy equipment in your labs, be generous to the folks with wacky ideas and invite them in to use your facilities uh, to test those ideas. And for those of you like me with wacky ideas, when you can't get funded, do it anyway. And I'll end up by saying there's a take home message for all of us no matter what scale we work at in oceanography. And these are the famous uh, uh, words of Yogi Berra, that well-known oceanographer. And that is, you can see a lot by looking. <laughs>